painting to photography, from beadwork to woodworking. KQAL FM on the campus of Winona State University presents Artbeat. Artbeat highlights the work and accomplishments of local artists from in and around Winona. Support for Artbeat is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Today on Artbeat, we continue our coverage of the 2019 Frozen River Film Festival. On this episode, I talked to one of the Emmy-winning producers of the film, Decoding the Driftless. Producer George Howe talks with us about the challenges of making the film, along with the beauty and wonder of the Driftless area that the film captures. Get ready for a journey through the Driftless area as I talk to producer George Howe. I'm Bill Stoneberg, and this is Artbeat. I'm here with George Howe. He's one of the producers of uh, Decoding the Driftless, which is uh, made by Sustainable Driftless. And uh, thanks for being on the show today, George. Well, you're welcome. I'm very happy to be here uh, talking about the film. It's been a wild ride. Yeah, I bet. It's a great film. Um, How did you uh, get involved in making the film? Well, I grew up around here and uh, was immersed in the beautiful nature here, uh, the river, the bluffs, the fish and wildlife. And and then uh, I studied biology at Winona State and... um, and, uh, uh, Worked as a scientist for many years for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and and I also uh, then I taught for quite a few years, and I did a lot of work with land trusts and land conservation, and uh, I was always learning about all these things here that were unique in the world, unique in North America, or a ton of stuff that's unique in the Upper Midwest, and I noticed that no one had ever made a documentary uh, about this area and you know you see all the elegant natures and novas and national geographics and uh, but there was never one about this area and i thought well darn it you know this is just as special as a lot of the stuff they're showing uh so somebody should do it well i was lucky to be working with tim jacobson at the time at the mississippi valley conservancy and uh, the universe brought us uh, Dan Bertland with Untamed Science uh, showed up one day. Uh, we had been talking about making a documentary, and he just came out of the blue from Madison and said, you guys ever thought about making a documentary? And we said, yeah, we've been thinking a lot about it. Uh, and he said, well, Untamed Science would be a great film production team uh, to work with. And we hired them you know, for the first uh, pilot film, Mysteries of the Driftless. That did so well, even won an Emmy. Uh, that we knew we had to make the feature length one, and that's what decoding the driftless is. So uh, we started a nonprofit four years ago, Sustainable Driftless. Uh, got board members, and we started raising money. That took about a year to get enough money to start, and then we filmed on and off for two years with Untamed Science, and raised more money. And then the fourth year was mostly all editing and Jonas Stenstrom uh, of Untamed Science uh, he was over in Sweden editing up film and he did a fabulous job because he had over 20 terabytes of 4k footage to deal with (laughs) (laughs) wow so this film's been a long time in the making then huh Um, and then you mentioned growing up here Uh, did growing up in the Driftless area did that uh play a role you mentioned your your background in biology did that play a role in you getting into biology in the first place yeah i think it was absolutely foundational um if i wouldn't have grown up out in the bluff lands uh with our family land overlooking the mississippi and i was hunting and fishing and camping and hiking and uh really just a a creature of the driftless <laughs> Uh, that really helped to direct me to study biology and earth science and chemistry in college. And I was lucky to have some fabulous mentors there, like Dr. Calvin Fremling, um, who was teaching, really, he was one of the only people teaching uh, the unique story of the Driftless area back in the 1970s. Wow, cool. So your interest goes way back. That's that's really neat. Um and then how old is the, you know, the Driftless area? It's kind of an area that the glaciers kind of didn't touch. How old is the area? Well, it depends on whether you're talking about the surface or the underlying bedrock. The, the layers of sedimentary rock in the Driftless region are from 
800 million years old to 400 million years old. Uh, and in some places, the deepest layers are almost a billion years old. So it's incredibly ancient. And um, the, the surface that we see today has largely been shaped by water erosion and rivers and streams over the last three million years. So uh, the surface, uh, you know, it's changed during that three million years, but this area was relatively flat. They used to call it, they called it the Paleozoic Plateau, uh, geologists did. Uh, and the rivers and streams, you know, dug down, eroded away all these valleys that we have and really created the terrain of the Driftless region. It's got a long and uh, really cool history. I like that. Um, was it? What was it like to go? You guys go to all these different places that are really neat in the film. Um, what was it like to visit all those places? It was an incredible amount of fun. Um, it was an incredible amount of work. But like most things in life that are worthwhile, it is a lot of work. Uh, it's also uh, very gratifying. Uh, to have the film done. Um, we had some real adventures filming. Uh, we purposely did not script or plan the film, you know, down to a specific level. So uh, I chose most of the locations and experts and we would just get people to show up and they were seeing things for the first time. And at least for the Untamed Science guys and much of our crew, it was a, a new adventure each time we were filming. Now, some of the experts like you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Dylan Blumentritt from Winona State, uh, he, of course, uh, had been to some of the locations and likewise with other experts. But it was a fabulous adventure, and I think it shows in the film. What, the reason people respond to the film so well is that the film is a real adventure. And uh, it wasn't created or scripted or, I mean, there was a certain amount of planning, like, yeah, we're going to kind of do this location this week and but you know nature and chaos theory threw us a lot of angles we had to adjust and change and adapt so this this film is uh, we're, we're still working on an extended cut a PBS cut so this early this director's cut is amazing but it's not even the final product of, of all those places is there one that is your favorite that you've been to well, I'd say it's a close tie between the huge underground river with all the cool form cave formations uh, uh, down um, just north of Decorah, Iowa. That was such a mind blow. Um, and to think that we have these vast underground rivers and streams under the Blufflands everywhere. And we know because of well drilling records. Um, the other place that was just off the charts uh, beautiful and memorable was uh, Maiden Rock and filming the peregrine falcons uh, nesting on the cliffs there, uh, climbing down. We had drones flying. Uh, you have Lake Pepin, this beautiful sea of blue stretching out in front of you and these huge rocky bluffs rising up 600 feet. Unbelievable. And you know anybody who's lived around here or wherever you're from, Visit Lake Pepin. Drive all the way around it, both sides. It is unbelievable, and it's, it's so cool. We get to tell the story in the world of how Lake Pepin is a very rare phenomenon. You have the Chippewa River damming up the Mississippi with, Sam, with sand, and that happens very rarely uh, throughout uh, history and over the world. Yeah, that was really interesting. I like that. And also, like you mentioned, the under, uh, underground caves. What was it like the first time you uh, saw that? Uh, how did that feel? Well, uh, the first cave we go in in the film, uh, I had been in there before, but uh, to have a film crew in there and new people uh, was just about as exciting as the first time. And going through the narrow spaces you know one of them is called the birth canal it's it, it's always a little tense and um the underground river in in northeastern iowa that was the first time i went down there the day we filmed and so it was brand new for everybody except we had a couple guides with us 
I don't know how to explain it, except it was a, it was a glorious combination of excitement, fear, curiosity, and just gratitude that I was able to do it. Nice. Yeah, it looked beautiful, too. It was really neat looking. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, as far as other places, you know, like I grew up in the area as well. And when I saw some of the aerial shots of like the bluffs and the effigy mounds, stuff like that, it really like it almost changes my view of the area, you know, and uh, magnifies it. Um, what was it like to see that kind of stuff? Or have you seen that before? Well, everybody I talk to who sees this film uh, and some of them, most of them just come to me or they send us emails or phone messages. They say that seeing the film was a life-changing event. And many of these people have lived here 60, 70, 80 years. But they say, I never knew all of this stuff. I knew some of it. And a lot of times they have an inkling, there's something special here, but they're just awestruck. Um, and to know that there are all these things unique in the world here, unique in North America or unique in the upper Midwest. And that, you know, we still have some of this stuff left unspoiled and we have a chance to conserve it and save it. Um, I never cease to be amazed at how people respond to this basic knowledge that we provide in the film and, and the beauty, uh, of it, the way it's shot, uh, it's very moving. It's very inspiring. And, of course, that's why we made the film. Uh, we want to, we think people should know. We think that's knowing where you live and the special things. It's a source of local pride. It gives you a sense of place. It's foundational to a, a deep, healthy life. And uh, we think that more and more people having that foundational knowledge of that they live in a a wonderful special place that they can be proud of and grateful for that that's going to change many things for the better yeah indeed i think it will um like i said it really changed my view just seeing those aerial shots you know i've never seen the bluffs from that angle and it was gorgeous um now i also want to talk about the correct me if i'm wrong in how this is said but algific talus slopes is that how you say that um were you already familiar with that, and can you briefly describe for us what that is? Yeah, I was uh, familiar with that rare habitat uh, because I helped uh, preserve some rare lands when I worked for the Mississippi Valley Conservancy. One of them was an algific talus slope, and what it is is it's a bluff where there are vents and air moves through loose uh, rock with lots of fractures and cracks, and the bluff is actually breathing cold air uh, throughout the spring, summer, and fall, uh, because of uh, ice built up inside the bluff in cavities and cracks and chambers. And so it, you have large masses of ice. It takes them a long time to melt. So uh, the air moves through the bluff and, and it, uh, from upper areas because cold air sinks and then down out these, these vents uh, halfway down the bluff and there's super cold air coming out in the middle of summer, and that creates a microenvironment where very rare plants and snails and other things live that are basically ice age species. And these cold air, areas that are cold all year round because of the bluffs breathing air, these species that were ice age species can still live there, but they're not found anywhere else on Earth. So it's an amazing uh, phenomenon. And just one example of super rare, super cool stuff here. Some of these sites are protected. Some of them are not even known of. Private landowners could have them. So because they're so rare, it's very important that we know about them, that people know, and, and that they know to, you know, stay off of them and, and don't disturb them. And, you know, some of them have been developed and had bulldozers go through them and make logging roads. And it's, it's just heartbreaking that that would happen just because people don't know. Yeah, it's good to get the word out there then so we can uh, preserve that stuff. Did How stark is the temperature difference? Like, can you feel the air coming out like a, like, you know, like a breeze? Oh, my gosh. Well, if you watch the film, you will, you will see that we hiked up there in July, and it was 95-plus humid. We were soaking wet with sweat 
after just hiking a little over a mile back through, you know, thick woods and stuff. But um, we, the film shows what a difficult adventure it was just to get there. And then we're soaking wet and so hot. We actually had one person go back because a reporter was with us and they started to have a stroke. They had, we had to have a team member go back and take them back to the vehicle. We almost canceled the whole day of filming. But the rest of us made it and the cold air coming out was so shocking. And for the first time visiting one of these sites, I, I brought a good thermometer. And I'm not gonna tell you how cold that air was, but you watch the film and you'll see it was way colder than we thought. And the temperature was so low that we couldn't even understand it scientifically at first until we thought about it for a while. So you see the film and you'll see Cool. Yeah, I was pretty shocked too at that. It was it was really neat. Um, and then, is there sometimes is there ice year round around those kind of vents or? Well, there's ice year round, but it's inside the bluff. Um, it gets too warm around here for too many months for ice to be on the surface. But underground, you know, it's insulated. You know, soil and rock. Uh, you don't have to go very far into the ground anywhere it gets down to 50 49 48 degrees so ice can last a long time when it's just you know if it's a big mass and it's close to 48 degree stuff and insulated it and the sun doesn't hit it ice can last a long time you just think of how they used to harvest ice all winter uh, from rivers and lakes up here and store it in big sheds and warehouses and barns with just sawdust and they would sell it all summer to people in you know, all over and they'd ship it down to Chicago and people had ice boxes and that's how you kept your food cold you had a big wooden cabinet and the ice would be on the top and the cold would sink and keep your food cold so it's like a giant natural ice box I like that what's the most interesting thing you learned throughout making this film well it would probably be when I when I see people's reaction to this film and you know that's the biggest mind blow. It's, I knew there would be uh, a positive reaction and an interest by some people, but I never dreamed it would be so broad. People of all ages, all persuasions, all politics, they all seem to be amazed at this information, hungry for it. And probably what's even most amazing within that is how much people want to share this. I mean, almost everybody that sees this film wants to buy a DVD. Some people want five or ten. They want to send them all over the place. And it seems the more we show the film, the more interest there is in it. You know, we showed it in La Crosse. We had 1,700 people show up to the world premiere. And I went to the Rivoli Theater, and it showed for seven weeks. And for weeks and weeks, the more we showed it, the more people kept coming. And that was because people were spreading by word of mouth. So that's a pretty good gauge. Uh, and the request for us to show the film and, and people who want to buy DVDs is uh, off the charts. And it's a, it's a blessing. And it's, it's very gratifying. And it's, but it's also somewhat shocking because you, you don't, uh, and as a small nonprofit, you know, sustainable driftless is, uh, we've got to do a lot of work to keep up with the interest. And that's a wonderful problem to have. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a great problem to have. Um, and I, I can relate. I, you know, a friend of mine, when she heard I was covering this, she said, uh, Oh my God, have you seen it? You know, and she loaned me her DVD. So that's how I was able to see it ahead of time. But, uh, it was, yeah, she was very excited about it as well. Um, did you learn anything new about yourself through the process? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars to make a quality film uh, will teach you a lot about yourself and your priorities. <laughs> and uh, it's difficult, especially when you have a family, you have kids in college, you have financial demands, and I had to keep working at least half time uh, while I was doing this film uh, to survive and pay the bills. <laughs> but, um, you know, working with a creative team always teaches you that uh, uh, you don't always have the best ideas, even though it feels like you do, <laughs> that you need to be flexible and listen to other people. Uh, you know, 
sometimes you learn that if you feel strongly about something, you really need to fight for it and, and teach the other people that it is the best way to go. So you learn both of those things. Um, you, you really learn how much you can push yourself and how much you can do, uh, too, when you take on a big project when you already have a full life. Um, but, uh, you know, in the end, you know, what I've learned is that if you have a calling or a passion to do something and it keeps coming up in your mind day after day, year after year, that this is something you should do, that it's worthwhile, that it's going to make the world a better place, that it's going to help people, that it's going to help the environment. You should do it. You know, listen to those voices. And, and you know, sometimes it's just a matter of kind of rejiggering your priorities and thinking creatively. Uh, it, it's, it, you're going to maybe have to sacrifice some things and maybe say, well, yeah, you know, I thought I was going to be in this certain job with this certain paycheck for until I retire, but maybe I can't be. Uh, maybe I have to take a leap of faith and do this uh, and, and hope that it pays off. And uh, what I found with this and other people that worked on it is that it was absolutely worth any sacrifice and any effort we made. Well, it certainly uh, seems worth it as a viewer, you know. Um, and then why do you think that this is such an important story to tell? Well, I've probably touched on some of that. But, you know, mainly I learned in my life how knowing these things as a biologist, as a, you know, earth scientist, it was a great benefit and joy to me. And so, you know, I wanted to share that. I wanted other people to feel this the same things, you know, to, to feel, know what it's like to know the land where you live and take pride in it and uh, be connected with it, feel part of it. I just think it's foundational to a really full human experience. Uh, I mean, we come from the earth and nature. Uh, in our modern lives, we're often disconnected from nature and the earth. Uh, we get so busy with things and it's easy to just go from one distraction to another and never really think deeply about your connection with the natural world from which we all come. And um, I also hope that the film inspires people to get out in nature, that when they see something beautiful in the film and they see people canoeing and hiking and camping and biking, that they will think, you know, I really need to do more of that or start doing it. It looks fun. Um, so many wonderful things happen when people connect with nature. They feel better. They're healthier. They're more inspired. Um, they feel a part of something. Uh, and we, we all need these things, uh, especially in this modern world. We need them more than ever. And uh, the more you get to know nature and see all the beauty and things, you know, whether you fish or you're birding or hunting or hiking or camping or canoeing, uh, it, it's going to help you feel good. And once you have positive experience with nature, you're going to care and you're going to want to see conservation because you're going to say, hey, this is great for me. I want it to be great for everybody. And I want it to be great for my children and future generations. Definitely. I would agree wholeheartedly on that. Um, and then uh, if someone wants to experience the Driftless for themselves, uh, is there a specific route you would tell them to take or uh, a certain path? Well, watch the film. There are all kinds of books and organizations now. If you Google Driftless anything, you're going to come up with a, a huge amount of uh, material but, you know, drive the Mississippi River, which is like an artery that goes through the middle of the Driftless. Uh, drive the Mississippi River from Hastings, you know, down to Dubuque and, you know, maybe even further down to the Quad Cities. Uh, there are some major rivers that also have bike trails and roads like the Root River uh, Scenic Byway. And there's bike trails in southeastern Minnesota. Uh, the Kickapoo River is a, like the a crown jewel of the Driftless, one of the, one of the oldest rivers on Earth, uh, and beautiful parks and land. Um, there's all kinds of outdoor recreation. So really, the, the river corridors are where it's at. 
Uh, there's other cool things too, but the river corridors are where probably the most scenic beauty, the most biodiversity uh, are. And, you know, I could go on and on. Um, uh, Ridgetop prairies, you know, wetlands. Uh, there's lots of bike trails and, you know, every stream, river offers, you know, a chance to kayak or canoe or trout fish or, or fish for other species or nature photography. It's just unlimited you know you could live here i've lived here my whole life and i know i will never get to do everything in the drift list that i want to right yeah there is definitely a lot to do a lot to do and see if people miss the showing of the film here at the film festival um where can they find out where it's showing or obtain a dvd or something like that well uh you can check out our facebook page is really what gets the most traffic um Sustainable Driftless. Just Google Sustainable Driftless and you'll see the Facebook page come up. And I don't think you need to be on or familiar with Facebook to see that. We advertise all the screenings. Uh, you know, coming up, we have a, a screening up in Wabasha uh, during what they call Grumpy Old Men Days. Remember the Hollywood movie Grumpy Old Men? Um, we have screenings down in Decorah, Iowa at the Oneota Film Fest in March. Um, we have dozens and dozens of screenings coming up all over. Um, people can also go to our website, www.sustainabledriftless.org, and purchase DVDs, Blu-rays, or T-shirts. So um, we have DVDs and Blu-rays for sale in many stores around the area, like Pearl Street Books and Lacrosse, uh, Drift Mercantile, I don't even know the whole list. We have volunteers distributing them, but um, you know, if you Google decoding the drift list, you're going to find a whole bunch of stuff. And check out our website, our Facebook page. We try to use those to inform people, you know, how they can see the film. It is really cool to see a screening in a theater as an experience with a group of people. That's the most awesome way. But if you can get a DVD or Blu-ray, watch it on home. If you have a good system it really pops and uh, you'll have a great experience, you know, share it with somebody you care about. Okay. So it's easy to find online. So uh, get out there and check it out. It's Decoding the Driftless. I've been here with George Howe. He's one of the producers for Decoding the Driftless. Uh, it's a film made by Sustainable Driftless and um, check it out. It's a great movie. It's a great uh, visuals and everything of the Driftless area. It's a wonderful film. So uh, thanks so much for being on the show today, George. You're welcome. It was a pleasure doing the interview, and uh, I hope to see all of you listeners out there at a screening uh, someday, or I hope you get a chance to watch it. And send us your comments, too, on our Facebook page and website. I, I love to see those. Uh, it helps us know, you know how we did. Thanks again to producer George Howe for joining us today on Artbeat. For more information about the film Decoding the Driftless, go to sustainabledriftless.org. To stream today's show or any other episode of Artbeat, go to kqal.org and look for Program Archives under the Media tab. I'm Bill Stoneberg, and I've been talking to producer George Howe on Artbeat. Artbeat is written and produced by KQAL-FM on the campus of Winona State University. Visit us on the web at kqal.org. Is art an important part of your life? Tune into Artbeat, Tuesdays at 1230, right here on 89.5 KQAL. Artbeat is made possible by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.